We're studying the life of uh, Abram, who then became uh, Abraham. Uh, just a little review, we, uh, we've looked at his journeys in Canaan and then to Egypt and back. Of course, his failures and successes in trusting God to protect and provide for him. God has made him promises and what we're observing is how well God is keeping his part of the bargain, but uh, it's kind of hit or miss with, with Abram. Sometimes he's there, sometimes he's not quite there as far as his faith is concerned. Uh, and his meeting with the great type for Christ's future priesthood, Melchizedek. Love that lesson, love that character, uh, that, that biblical character, Melchizedek, after uh, the defeat of the northern kings uh, and saving his nephew Lot, he meets with Melchizedek. Uh, you know, the Bible or the Lord provides a type for Christ because there wasn't a type for him in the Old Testament among the priests. You know, Christ was going to be a priest unlike the priests that they had in the Old Testament. And so God provides Melchizedek as that type, that preview. And we talked about that last time. I'm not going to review that again. So in the next couple of chapters, we're going to see the same patterns of promises and then, their, and then failures as Abraham continues. And remember, uh, I want us to remember a, a kind of a phrase here. He continues his journey of faith as we all are on. We are on a journey of faith. That's why some people, you know, they get very nervous about their faith, am I good enough? And da, da, because they see you know, salvation in such black, black and white terms. You know. When we understand that we enter into a faith relationship with God and once we're in that relationship, that relationship you know, uh, can, that relationship can, um, uh, can encompass you know, our ups and our downs as far as our failures and our successes are a concern. Okay, so uh, after the battles, uh, we see Abraham, you know, battles against the northern kings there, we see Abraham actually feeling his own mortality. And he's beginning to wonder how God is going to fulfill certain parts of his promises. You know, nothing focuses the mind like nearly getting killed, right? <laughs> if you have a car accident or a serious disease, your phone blows up on you, you know what I'm saying? That uh, nothing focuses the mind. So he's had a battle here, you know, outnumbered these five kings. You know? So that kind of focuses the mind. And so we get to chapter 15, beginning in uh, verse one. And um, uh, we're going to see how he now, you know, he's, he's questioning some of these promises here. So let's read chapter 15, verse one. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear Abram. Why would God say to Abram, do not fear? Because <laughs> Abram was afraid, that's why. I am a shield for you, or to you rather. Your reward shall be very great. So God reassures Abram after the tremendous battle that he has been in. Now there's some interesting ideas introduced just in this particular verse. For example, it is the first mention, first time the word of the Lord appears here to signify God Himself. You know, in the, in the Gospel of John, you know, the word becomes, in the, beginning, in the beginning was the word, right? And then eventually we say, and the word became flesh, right? Well, here in the Old Testament, it's the first time that the word of the Lord is actually put forth, this idea, okay? Um, the word is a vision of some sort, the Lord revealing himself somehow to Abram to offer reassurance and renew the promise. Um, these are also the very first I am passages in the Bible. I am thy shield, I am thy reward. You know, Jesus often used this manner of speech you know, to describe himself. We know, in the new, you know, he says, I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the door, uh, the vine, the alpha, the omega, you know, all these I am statements. Well, this is the first time that 
deity uses that phrase to describe himself. All right. um, and also it's the first, but certainly not the last time, the admonition, fear not, appears as a way of reassuring Abram. I mean, it reassures many other Bible characters, but the, the first but not the last time that God says this uh, to, uh, to Abram. You know, Adam, he heard the voice of the Lord and he was afraid, but Abram is told not to be afraid when he hears the voice of the Lord. What a difference, eh? God didn't say to Adam, fear not, because Adam was under judgment. You better be afraid. <laughs> But Abram was not under God's judgment. You see what I'm saying? So he receives the assurance. So when Abram hears the word, he's not afraid because he believed God. Interesting comparison between Adam and Abram. Okay. Adam received you know, a fig leaf to cover his shame. But Abram receives a shield. I am thy shield. And so what Abraham or Abram receives is encouragement. What Adam received was simply hmm, help to cover his shame. Adam is the father of all men. Abram is the father of all who believe. Adam loses paradise. Abram is promised the Lord himself, the creator of paradise, as his reward. Doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, David in the Psalms often say that you, you know, he says to God in his prayers, you are the portion of my cup, right? You are the portion of my cup. You are my reward, you know? David expresses that intimate relationship that believers have with God, that they intellectually know that they have, you know what I'm saying, but every once in a while, because of whatever reason, maybe because of God, we, be, we, we sense it, we feel it, that we have that relationship with God. Sometimes it's in prayer, or sometimes something happens and we go, oh God, thank you, I know you're working here, you know what I'm saying? It'd be nice if that feeling or that sense of connection was always there, but it isn't, isn't it? It's, it's there sometimes, you know, and in, in between those times we just, we, we're working on faith. And then there are other times when we're, quote, in the spirit, it's like, wow, you know. I could be a martyr right now because there's nothing that would take me away from belief. You know, it's so strong. You know. And then the next day you wake up and you go, man, what, what happened? <laughs> back to work. <laughs> you know, back to work. Okay, so this is, this is the, the thing that's happening here with uh, Abram. All right, so let's keep reading verses uh, two to six. He says, Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer? of Damascus. And Abram said, since you have given me no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. And so then behold, the word of the Lord, there it goes again, the word of the Lord, okay? The word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but, no, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So Abram is confronted uh, or comforted rather at God's word of encouragement. You know, God is saying, don't worry, you, know, you just had a, you had a close call, you had a battle with the five kings, uh, you know, a lot of people were killed, you know, he's coming back, his heart's beating fast, he, he, he realizes, hey, I'm not going to live forever here, you know, like I said, coming near to death focuses the mind. So God tells him, I'm your shield, and you know, he comforts him, right? But his brush with death now focuses him on the main issue, and that is an heir. And he hears God's promise of having many descendants in the future, but so far he doesn't even have a son of his own. 
not even one kid. So what he sees is that his steward, who is not even a family member, will inherit everything. Apparently, Lot has not returned to live with him. You know, after all the trouble that Lot has just had, you'd think he'd say, you know, maybe I should go. I should go back. You know, I would. But he doesn't do that. He stays, where he's, he stays where he's at. So in this same vision, the Lord assures him that he will, from his own seed, produce a child. Of course, it's still in the realm of possibilities because so far as he know, as far as he knows, he is not barren or sterile as he knows that Sarah is. The other thing about you know, if, his, if his steward has the children, think now, in Abraham's mind, if his steward has the children, well, technically God's promise is fulfilled, right? Because the steward belongs to Abraham, uh, you know, and they'll, you know, the descendants will be there, just like, like God said, except one thing. Abram's, remember we talked about eternal life? Abram's hope of living on, you know, he can't live on through somebody else's children. They've got to be his children. So he might be thinking, just a speculation here, but he might be thinking, oh, that's great, God. Your promises are being fulfilled. Okay, lots of people are going to come out of my household, but me, who just nearly died over here and feeling my mortality, maybe me, I'm, I'm done. See what I'm saying? So God renews the promise, and this time He compares His future generations to the stars in heaven. Now another first here in verses six, the word believe, and combined with the words counted and righteousness, we have right here the core of the Christian faith described in this one verse right here. Man, that's why I say the gospel in the Old Testament. If you want to see where the gospel is in the Old Testament, Bang, it's right here. So look, let's look at those three words, shall we? First of all, he says, to believe, to accept as true. Also means to trust, to support. So it's a combination of all these things. To, to accept that a premise or a promise or a fact is true and, to, and, and this belief engenders trust and confidence in you. So that whole idea of faith. Then the word counted, originally it meant to weave, but it came to mean to impute or to regard or to consider. You know, in other words, the word impute means to give someone certain credentials or credibility for a particular reason. And one of the best examples that I can think of is um, in, a, in a university somewhere, they invite someone, a speaker, perhaps an entertainer, a politician, someone like that, and that person will give the commencement address to the students, right? And as a reward, or sometime usually as a lure to bring that personality, to bring that famous person to give the speech, they will offer him a, an honorary doctorate degree, and it's a real, Degree. I mean, you, know, you, you get to call yourself doctor because they've given you an honorary doctoral degree, right? Well, here's the thing. Did you take any courses for that? Did you write a thesis? Did you defend your thesis? Did you, was there any coursework, any field work that you did to earn that thing? Absolutely not. That's why they call it a, quote, honorary honorary degree. I remember Bob Hope reading an article. Bob Hope had like, I don't know, 50 of them, 100 of these things, because he went and spoke everywhere. They wanted him to come, you know what I'm saying? Nevertheless, the idea is that they impute. They impute on you. They give you this honorary thing. You didn't do anything to deserve it, okay? So this word impute here, that's what it means to be counted at. It means we give it to you. And then of course, righteousness. This is the first time it is used in this way in the Bible. It means to have a moral justness or a cleanliness or a virtuousness or an acceptability. In other words, good to the point that you're acceptable to God. So when you put them together, what you get is that God gave to Abram a moral rightness and a virtue that he did not otherwise obtain or achieve. And he did this because Abram accepted as true what God promised him. 
God promised that in the future his generations would multiply, that he would give him land and people would be blessed. And Abram believed God and because he believed in God's promise that God was going to fulfill this promise, it's so strange. Not only did the promises come true, but God also imputed, gave him an honorary degree of you're okay, you're acceptable, you're right. Okay? That's the gospel. That is the gospel. That is, if you want to peel the onion and get right to the core of the gospel, the diamond point of the gospel, the radioactive ingredient of the gospel, that's it right there. That's it right there. Now the last lesson I explained what a type was. Remember we talked about a type, a preview if you wish. A type is a person or an event or a thing that prefigures or billboards or prepares us for something or someone or some event in the future. So I said that Melchizedek was a type for the priesthood of Jesus Christ. The ark was a type for the church. You know, only the people in the ark were saved, only the people in the church are saved, there's only one door into the ark, there's only one door into the church, Jesus, you know. Uh, animal sacrifice was a type to prepare our minds to understand the sacrifice of Christ. All right? We talked about types. Okay, well, Abram is a type for every Christian. Okay? God imputes or gives or considers us righteous, meaning morally acceptable to Him and thus worthy of heaven, because we believe that what He tells us is true. And believe it or not, that's one of the hardest things for a human being to do because it's counterintuitive. Now what he tells us to believe is that Jesus is the Christ and that we should obey Him. So if we believe in Jesus, in other words what God tells us about Jesus, then several things naturally follow. We reject sinfulness as a way of life. It's so hard to understand this idea. Uh, some people say, yeah, but I can't understand why I'm saved, I still sin. Yes, but sin is not a way of life for a Christian. It's an aberration in our lifestyle. Yeah, we sin, yeah, we make mistakes, yeah, we have bad thoughts, yeah, you know, whatever. But it isn't the way of life that I've chosen. And um, it's too much to say, perhaps, that someone loves to sin. But most of us, we don't really care much about it before we become Christians. You know? Like we give ourselves plenty of excuses to indulge all of our vices. You know what I'm saying? I remember a guy says, well, you know, he smoked a pack and a half. I always go back to cigarettes because it's an easy thing. You know, it's an easy vice to talk about. I used to know a guy who smoked a pack and a half of cigarettes a day. You know what I'm saying? And his indulgence was because it calms my nerves. You know, and, and that's it. You know, or uh, if you're not a Christian, you're not worried about living a virtuous life or setting an example or giving honor to God. You can find any or all excuses for your vices. I mean, shoot, you know, if you want to gamble, if you want to watch porn, if you want to cheat, the, you know, people cheat on their income tax. You know, I mean, I don't just mean fudge a, a nickel or a dime or round up or round down. I'm talking about you know, hiding money you know, and under the table and blah, blah, blah. And, and what do they say to justify that? Well, the government's a bunch of cheaters and they waste money and so on and so forth. It's my money, blah, 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 blah. You know. So what I'm saying with all of this is that you know, uh, repentance simply means I didn't used to care about sin, but now I do. You know, the, the way of life that I've chosen for myself will mean that I will care about these things in the future. Okay? Um, so if we believe in Jesus, as I say, we reject sinfulness as a way of life. We are baptized according to His command. Uh, we follow Him in this life into the next. Now, the confusion in the religious world is that some teach that so long as there is an intellectual assent or agreement that we accept as true what God has said, then God imputes righteousness to us. But our study of the life of Abraham will show that when Abram believed God, he was entering into a relationship where his belief led him to serve and obey God 
throughout his entire life. I don't know about you, but you know, I've been a Christian you know, a long, long, long time, uh, since uh, 1977. And uh, even to this day, I recognize in my day and at certain moments, oh, you know, it's like my inside voice is saying to me, oh, oh this is a test, I get it. <laughs> oh, you know, it's like I have this dialogue with the Spirit. You know, oh, 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 we're going to work on this again today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my critical nature, you know, I get away with it for a couple of days and all of a sudden, boop, oh, 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 we're working on that. Oh, you mean I have to dial it back? Okay, all right, I'm working on it. You know? It's a way of life. Every day is a way of life. Why? Well, because I'm this disciple and I'm following Jesus and the Lord decides from day to day what we're going to be working on today. Okay? So, uh, God did not impute righteousness upon Abram just because he said he believed or because he managed to do everything right. He imputed righteousness on him because his belief led him to enter into a faith relationship with God where he trusted God to fulfill all of his promises regardless of his ups and downs in their relationship. So I say to Jesus before I go into that water, you know, I say to him, look, uh, you know I'm not perfect. I'm not even going to be perfect when I come out of this. You know, but you know what? I, I, trust, I trust your promise that despite my weaknesses, you're going to save me. Despite my weaknesses, despite my failings, I trust that you will save me. That's the kind of faith that that God is looking for. So that's why this story here as a type to prepare us for our own relationship with God. And each one of us, as I say, has a relationship that is as deeply personal and involved as Abraham was. We all have a deep relationship with God. If we choose to uh, exercise it, you know, I mean, if we choose to spend time in prayer and read the Bible and not have every waking moment glued to some sort of video device you know, or noise-making device. Okay. Golf is excluded from that, but uh, everything else you know, is, is unvirtuous. Anyways, so <clears throat> God imputes righteousness upon us because through faith, which is expressed in repentance and baptism, which is how God commands believers to respond to Him. You know, how do we express our faith? Through repentance and baptism. Through faith, we enter into a lifetime relationship with God. The repentance and the baptism part, that's just walking through the door. And we're continually and fully righteous because we have faith. I've, you've heard me say this before, you don't get any more pure or saved than the moment you come out of the waters of baptism. <laughs> That's it. You come out of the, you said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, I do. Okay, I baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins. Boom. That's it. That's as good as you get. You don't get any better than that. You don't get any more righteous than that in God's eyes. In practical terms, you mature, of course, as we all do. But the quality of your righteousness before God does not improve with time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't. We continue to be fully righteous because we believe that God will accomplish all the promises He's made to us. Resurrection, never mind what He promised Abraham, what does He promise to us? Resurrection, glorified body, eternal life, and exalted position. Because he's also promised, he promised Abraham, you know, land, lots of kids, all that. But us, he's promised exalted position at the right hand of God. That's the end game. We wonder, well, why are we being saved and where are we going? The end game is we're at the right hand of God. We become part of the Godhead somehow. I can't explain, I don't get the metaphysics of that, you know? But the naked promise is we sit at the right hand with Christ. What is he talking about? We'll judge angels. Well, angels, that's the spirit world. Oh, so that's the end game. There's something for us in the next world 
and it's a high position in the next world, and that's, that's been promised to us. And just as Abraham couldn't quite imagine you know, how all of this would be worked out, but we do know how, because we've got the story. You know, Abraham dies, but we read the story. In the same way, we can't quite figure out how that's going to work, but God knows, and Christ knows, because He knows the rest of the story, and one day we will as, we will as well. All right, let's keep reading. So <clears throat> in verse seven he says, and he said to him, God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you, and that's by the way what Abraham was, or Abram was, what, what nationality, he was a Chaldean. He took a Chaldean who had its own culture and its own people and its own history, he took one Chaldean man and he brought him to Canaan and stripped him down and just rebuilt him into another nation, okay? Uh, brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give, this land, give you this land to possess it. He said, O oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Uh, it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Kenizzite, and the Kadmonite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Rephaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. So in the balance of this chapter, Abram wants God to give him a sign that these, the, I, you know, I believe you, God knows, but please give me a sign, give me something to go on. A natural thing, I'm just a human being. So in Abraham's time, the idea of eternal life, like we think of it, as I mentioned it before, uh, of per personal conscious existence without end was not as developed as it is today. God has revealed to us through His word that this is the substance of His promise to us. But for Abram, the idea of a son and descendants was as close to the concept of eternal life as he understood, as I mentioned. The idea of living on through his descendants was why the matter of having a son was so important to him. So as a sign, God gives him a vision of the future of his generations, okay? the good and the bad, and a covenant sacrifice is made between the two of them with interesting features, because if you didn't understand what was going on with all the animals split in two and the birds and this and that, here's a little clarification, okay? First of all, each of the five acceptable animals were laid out to sacrifice. They were cut in two with half of each placed on either side of a, and a space between them. So you took, he took the animals, he cut them in two, and he put half and half on each side, and there's a space between them. Now the fact that there were five animals indicates that the cost of the promise would be great, because when you did an animal sacrifice, you, you sacrificed one animal at a time. Here there's five animals, okay? The custom of the day was that when the covenant was made, each person would pass between the rows of the sacrifice to show that they were bound by the covenant that the sacrifice represented and ratified. So a covenant, if it was made between two people, they'd take the animal, they'd split it, put it aside, then they would walk through, okay, the, 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 the animals 
as a symbol that they were both part of, it's like signing, you know, we sign a contract, both people sign the contract, well both individuals walked through in the middle of the, of the sacrificial animals before they were sacrificed. Okay? Now the idea was that if either broke the covenant, then the death of the animal would no longer be sufficient and the death of the offending participant would be required. So you were bound on your word in a covenant and the, you were bound by life and death. So the animal was sacrificed symbolically to symbolize that. If you broke your word, then it wasn't the animal's life that was given up, it was your life. Okay? Now, <clears throat> after the initial preparations, if you remember the story I just read, nothing happens. Nothing happens, signifying how long it would take for God to fulfill the promise. Remember the big picture. He's giving him a vision that'll give him an idea of what's going to happen in the future with his generations. All right? So Abram even had to chase away, in the vision, he even had to chase away birds of prey who wanted to destroy the carcasses of these animals. And of course, this is a symbol of Satan's constant attempts to destroy God's relationship and God's promises through man. Remember that other little subplot I told you about? The seed of promise, you know, the, the, sub, the sub stories, Satan always trying to sh you know, short circuit God's thing. Well, this is an allusion to that, the birds coming to try to destroy the sacrifice, okay? All right, thirdly, the vision then takes a very dark turn to describe the suffering of his descendants in Egypt. As he tells them, you know, you, there's going to be some suffering for many, many centuries. He tells them this in the vision. And then the smoking furnace and the burning lamb passing through between the sacrifice symbolizes God's presence passing through the two parts of the offering. I want you to note that only God goes through the middle and not Abram, as was the custom that both parties go through. Because when two men made a, a covenant, both of them went through. But here in the vision, only God goes through, not Abram. Okay? This was to signify that the covenant needs only God's ratification to be complete. When God makes a covenant, you don't have to sign. He, he's, he's the only signature that you need. So in a covenant between God and man, man agrees to enter into it, but the conditions and the guarantees that it will be fulfilled, all of that belongs to God. And then finally, God now clearly indicates the second part of His promise to Abram. The first part was that He would, be, uh, you know, he would have a son and that is the extent of the, of the land promise. From the desert in the south to the Euphrates in the north, all of the peoples that lived there would be conquered. And we know that under Solomon and Jeroboam, 1 Kings uh, and 2 Kings 14, this promise was ultimately fulfilled in a physical way. The Jews did you know, rule over this land. So, so, so he makes the promise for the, that he'd have a son, and then he gives him more details about the land, how big it would be. It'll go from you know, the Euphrates River in the north all the way down to the, the river in the south. You know, all that land would be, would be theirs. God also gives us a guarantee of our promise as well. His word describes the resurrection of Jesus, His eventual return and judgment, the trouble that we're going to suffer before the end, you know, the book of Revelation, and what we must do to remain faithful. All right. So the word is our vision and our guarantee of the future. So the fullness of God's promises that include prosperity, protection, posterity, are now made by God and confirmed by Him through a covenant, this covenant. And I hope the description of the covenant kind of sheds some light on because you know, when you first read that, it makes, it makes absolutely no sense. All right. So I hope you see there that God is giving him a vision of how he's going to carry out this uh, covenant. In the next section, we'll do next week, we're going to see how these promises work out and look at some of the ups and downs 
that Abram has in his walk with God. So let's finish with a couple of application lessons there. Yeah, we'll get done with this. All right, well, I mean, this lesson begs to be, <laughs> you know, this is Bible 101, you know, application level, a lesson from this section. We are saved by faith. What saves us is that we are, uh, excuse me, what saves us is that we are moral and we are acceptable to God to be with Him. What makes us moral and pure is that God considers us this way and He imputes to us, gives to us this condition fully and freely. It's as if moral perfection was like a, a complete coat that we put on over the ugliness and it goes from the neck all the way, all the way down. What causes Him to give this to us is that we believe Him the same way that Abram did. We enter into a relationship just like Abram did. Now he says that he will accept us if we accept Christ. I mean, you know, do we believe this or not? So that's always the thing I ask myself. I can only use myself as an example. I don't know anyone else's heart. If I have a tough decision, I always ask myself, do I believe or don't I? Come on, that's, a, that's the bottom line. If I don't believe, then don't, let, let this nonsense go. If I still believe this, then come on. Let's get a move on. Let's do what I got to do. Of course, we have the gospel and the church, and the gospel and the church ex helps us to accept Christ, whether we, you know, the way we live, the conditions of our faith, and so on and so forth. But what saves us is that we believe God. And when I fail, my prayer is, God, forgive me for my failure, Forgive me for my failure, forgive me for my sin, but please know that despite my failing, I still believe. Because nothing you will do will make me stop believing. The danger is the things I'm going to do to myself or, you know, or some other sinner will do to me that will kind of knock me down as far as my faith is concerned. So I always, and I share this with you, I always combine my repentance with a renewed you know, confession of faith. Yes, I've messed up, but I still believe, I still have faith that you will save me despite this setback, despite this failure that I've, that I've had. Second lesson, we continue to be saved by faith. We will see that Abram had lots of serious ups and downs after he entered his faith relationship with God and the thing that kept him a righteous man while he was failing or succeeding was not his degree of success or failure. It was his belief that God will fulfill his promise despite his degree of success or failure. So faith is what keeps you righteous, not perfectionism. And thirdly, we will succeed by faith. Even though he had ups and downs, ultimately God fashioned a successful, faithful servant out of him. Again, using my own life as a, an example, I'm better than I used to be. You know, if I look back at who I was in 1980 and then 1990 and 2000, I'm better than I was then. There are things that I, you know, don't knock me over as quickly as they did. There are certain uh, allurements or temptations, they don't have the same draw as they used to. Before, you know, there'd be a temptation, I'd say, well, maybe, you know, maybe just a little bit, you know, and now it's, nah, nah, come on. It's over in a hurry. It's like, you know, being married for a long time, stuff that used to take you hours, you know, to work out, you know, in your relationship, and you talk and talk, now it takes, you know, like 30 seconds. Oh, I'm sorry, we're good, boom, and you move on, right? In a good relationship. So the promise is that God will take a bad person who believes and make a righteous person out of them and will make a faithful servant out of them. So Abram lived a long time and God made a great servant out of him. But his promise to us is that whatever he doesn't finish here, he's going to complete in heaven. That's the promise if we only believe that He will. So whenever you are failing, please don't be discouraged. Satan's best attack is when you fail. That's, that's when he'll whisper to you to stop believing or to give up on yourself or to give up certainly on the Lord, give up on His grace, don't do that.